I'm Andrea, and I'm really nervous. <laughs> Thank you for coming to hear our stories. I was jolted awake. I was sitting straight up in bed, and I looked at the clock. And it was 5.15 in the morning. Why was I awake? Like any teenager, I rolled over and went back to sleep. The next thing I knew, I was jolted awake again, this time by my little brother's screams. Daddy shot himself! I buried my face in my pillow, and every emotion that I ever felt swirled together. Anger, pain, confusion, this was it. My life was over. Somehow, robotically, I went down the stairs to find my mom. The door to my parents' bedroom was in my path, and every bone in my body knew not to look. My brother was not able to escape that haunting image. He knew what to tell the 911 dispatcher when they ask, where is the bullet hole? In his heart. My brother was 11. And I was 14. And 25 years ago, on a Tuesday morning, we became fatherless. Clustered on the front porch with our next door neighbors, our house was crawling with authorities. There was a policeman that was asking my mother about her marriage. Everything was fine, she said. Nothing was wrong. Tearful and desperate, my little brother asked, can the doctors give him a heart transplant and make him better? Internally, I screamed at him. No, how can you be so stupid? He's dead, Joshua, he's dead. All I felt was rage. My dad used a gun to shoot himself in the heart. In my parents' bed, in our house. My mom was out for a morning jog, and my brother and I were peacefully asleep in our beds. Stanley Steamer came to clean the carpet the best they could, but it didn't completely remove the blood stain from the floor. I don't know how long it was before the carpet was finally replaced. The blood stain mattress was switched out immediately, but my mom slept in the same bed, in the same room, in the same house for more than 22 years. That house was my prison and the scene of the crime that changed my life forever. That same house was somehow her sanctuary. She said so herself multiple times. My dad's funeral was held at Central Baptist Church so it could hold the 2,000 people that came to pay their respects, most of whom were his former students. He was an eighth grade history teacher for more than 25 years and claimed the title of everyone's favorite teacher. In the receiving line, it was like a broken record. Your dad changed my life and helped me be the person that I wanted to be. At the end of my father's funeral, my mother spontaneously got up and went to the pulpit. 
She proclaimed that while we might not understand what happened to her David, this was all part of God's plan to bring more people into his kingdom. I was horrified. The last time I saw my mom cry about my dad was at the funeral. She's had a smile plastered on her face ever since we left the graveside. That fake front is probably because we went to a church that believed that everyone who died by suicide went straight to hell to burn for eternity. She made me and my brother go to that church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. The message of that church suffocated me. She called herself the Bride of Christ and exclaimed Jesus promised to be her husband, protect her, and keep her safe. Today, she is even writing a book called The Bride of Christ, a collection of her journal entries over the years where Jesus spoke to her and she transcribed his words. The same woman who is writing this book never talked to me about what happened to my dad. It was as if it never happened. I don't remember anyone asking me how I was doing or giving me a hug, or really even looking me straight in the eye for years. Now I can see that everyone was just so numb and so paralyzed about what we were not talking about, how my dad had abandoned us all, and how my mom was or wasn't really handling it. Resentment grew towards my mother for her togetherness, for her faith in some higher power that allowed this tragedy to happen, for the fact that she was constantly trying to change me to be more like her instead of my dad. I was convinced that I loved my dad more than she ever could. My dad could do no wrong, and even suicide didn't change that. But now, inadvertently, I learned by her example. I pushed my feelings away, burying them deep down, never to dig them up again. But now, I am proud to say that I am unearthing my feelings. They say, practice forgiveness. Supposedly, it's not about condoning what someone did. It's about releasing yourself from the pain of your anger and resentment. Well, I'm not really sure how the fuck I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> but I do have a good therapist, and we are working on that together. They say, identify strengths you've developed because of your past relationships. Well, I'm not really sure how the fuck I'm supposed to do that either. <laughs> I didn't have consistent, strong, encouraging female figures growing up, other than Oprah. <laughs> so instead, I'm trying to be that person for someone else. I've mentored Kendra now for seven years. She's a 16-year-old. She's a junior in high school. And her dad also died when she, was, when she was 14. Kendra and I are so different. But I have learned so much from her. And I am so thankful that she is in my life. I do not think that it's a coincidence that we found each other. Over the years, I've come to realize that I have to focus on the good I can do because of what I have experienced. Someone may have hurt you, but now you get to choose. Do 
Do you pick up where they left off and continue to hurt yourself? Or do you empower yourself to do something good? Not in spite of where you've been, but because of it. My dad died of a broken heart, but I have to live with one every day. I constantly have a voice in my head saying, I can't do this. But there's another voice saying, yes, you can. And so I do. I believe that voice of positivity and perseverance, pushing me to do more, to be more, better and not better, is my dad. Thank you.